the tax man gets hacked, the problems with Japan's startup scene, and Oculus gets a price tag. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 346 for Wednesday, May 27th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash tn2, that's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash tn2. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney, and this is a show where we talk about the tech news with the people who care about it as much as you do, maybe even more than you do, if that's possible. Now let's get to some news. The Associated Press reports that cyber criminals have hacked the IRS website, gaining access to the past tax returns of over 100,000 people. To hear the full report and find out how the site was hacked, as well as what you can do to help protect your data, watch or listen to this morning's episode of Tech News Today. You can find it at twit.tv slash TNT. We will get to the rest of the headlines after the break, but first I'd like to welcome Elise Hugh, NPR's South Korea Bureau Chief. Welcome, Elise. Hey there, Megan. It's good to be with you again. How's it going over there? It's going great. You know, I've started kind of dipping my toes in some of the tech reporting that I used to do uh, for NPR back in D.C., so it's been fun. Yeah, I noticed that you were first just covering the Korea-Japan scene, and now things seem to be mostly tech-related that you've been writing lately. Well, um, obviously, this is an area of interest for me. And so um, as Korea bureau chief, I also get to cover Japan. That's one of my countries. Um, I'm really fascinated by what's going on with the startup scene there because it seems like, you know, we haven't heard of major companies out of Japan like we did back in the 80s. Like, you know, the Sharp, the Sonys, the Toshibas. Uh, they had to start somewhere <laughs> and um, they grew themselves into these electronic behemoths. And so we're and obviously there's a difference between hardware and software. Um, but since then, you know, we haven't heard of similar uh, Japanese companies sort of breaking out in a huge global way in the way that those companies did 30 years ago. And why is that? Do you think why, why aren't we seeing the same thing we're seeing in Silicon Valley over there? Yeah, I looked into the question a little bit. Um, one of it, it has to do with the risk averse nature culturally, you know, obviously that uh, saying that you hear again and again, culture eats strategy for lunch. And what happened is that a lot of these companies back in the 80s that became huge, became really safe um, lifetime employment for a lot of young Japanese folks coming out of school. And so it was sort of this, it became this narrow path to success. And so uh, it actually discouraged risk. And as you and the audience knows as well as anyone, that risk um, is a key ingredient in order to make entrepreneurship and startups successful. And so fewer and fewer young Japanese decided to take a risk and go out on a limb. Um, and then there's very little venture capital money pouring into a startup ecosystem, um, at least until the last few years. There are some signs that things are turning around, but the, the cultural sort of aversion to risk has been a huge problem for Japan in particular. Right. I mean, you write that um, now some of those big companies are the ones that are failing where the smaller upstart, you know, startup companies are doing better. So maybe that's what will change over there. Yeah. So like one irony is, right, is that you thought that you would get a job at Sony and then be employed for life. Right. And what's happening now is that as even these big companies have proven, they are big. They are big, but they're not too big to fail. Um, they're having to for, they're having to do some layoffs or cut pensions and do, do some things that uh, a lot of these employees never thought would happen to them. And so in a sort of way as the big giants struggle that's actually encouraging young people to say you know what I'm gonna do a different path I'm gonna I'm gonna try and do something on my own and luckily there's a lot of VC backed um, accelerators uh, and communities uh, that are encouraging young people to try something new so what about where you are in South Korea is the startup scene similar there 
Uh, the startup scene is actually healthier in um, South Korea, largely, you know, because this is a really wired society, as you know. It's small. I mean, there's probably, there is a Fulbright researcher here that I talk to a lot, and um, she calls it about 500 startups. And so, uh, and given the rate of failure for startups, that's not a whole lot. But uh, the community is tight. It's not really balkanized. Um, and then we obviously Google just backed something called Campus Soul, uh, which is a place for startups to sort of incubate and grow. Um, it's not a necessarily an extension of Google. It's Google backed. Um, but we're already seeing a lot of fresh ideas and new companies kind of getting born there or getting developed there. And so there's there are some exciting pockets of activity happening uh, in Seoul or in South Korea generally and some really uh, dynamic young entrepreneurs that I've gotten to meet. Yeah, I've been reading a little bit about the the Google um, place for startups. It sounds like maybe like a co-working space, sort of like a lot of people just there, you know, interacting. Is that, have you been to visit it? That's right. I have been and it's its own standalone institution. So really, um, it's a campus and it's a campus that's about convening communities. So it isn't, you know, a part of Google. It, again, it's, you know, Google fueled some money into it, but um, it's really about sort of a space where people can come together, collaborate, um, work and, 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 and think a little bit differently and, and, and maybe um, be a place where the next big sort of Korean company can come out of. Right. I also heard that they have a mentoring program for fem female entrepreneurs with children. I don't know if you've heard anything about that. I don't know if that was just PR or something that had already taken off. Well, yeah, I, I, I heard about the mentoring program, but um, but that you actually bring up something really interesting, which is the drive to get more women entrepreneurs um, in the startup economy here in Korea. Um, this is a pretty traditional society. Uh, most of the time when I'm out and about and I see families, it's moms that are taking care of the kids and then the fathers who work and, and then go drinking with their bosses until one or two in the morning. That's um, a part of the chable culture. A chable uh, is one of those super conglomerates like Samsung or LG, a lot of the companies that you know. Um, what the opportunity of the startup community provides is something different, right? It's for women to actually be the ones starting the companies and women to have some more choices in the structure of their lives in order to balance uh, their various priorities and not just work and going out drinking until one or two in the morning. That's interesting. I, it's, it's often what I see here too, unfortunately. <laughs> Not that so much drinking, but it is a lot. You know, in the <laughs> suburbs, there's still a lot of families where the the man is the one going off to work and the woman is staying home with the kids. So it goes back to the whole Japan idea. You know, cultural change um, is really key to, to to changing policy and changing structures. Right. So let's move back to Japan. Uh, another story you posted about uh, Chihira, the humanoid robot from a Japanese department store. Tell us about her. Chihira Aiko. Yes, she's quite lifelike. She um, looks more like a wax figure than an R2-D2 type robot. And she got a gig actually being a receptionist at the Mitsukushi department store in, um, in Tokyo. Uh, she is developed by Toshiba's, Toshiba's um, innovation lab uh, after somebody from Toshiba. Toshiba saw kind of an early prototype from Osaka University. And um, she's made out of silicone. I don't know if you guys have images that you're showing of mm -hmm. her now, but she's making, she's made out of silicone and her movements are actually quite lifelike. They're very smooth because Toshiba's developers really focused on um, really subtle movements that are more like, more human-like. Um, and he said that the, the guy from Toshiba that I interviewed actually said that they were really wary about this notion of um, the uncanny valley and they didn't want they didn't want to fall into it and scare children. And so they worked really hard on it's powered by 43 motors um, and lots of simultaneous data. Um, so they did their best to sort of mimic just the, the, the smooth and sort of unintentional movements that humans make even when we're still. And so she can interact and she can speak Japanese and Mandarin, depending on what you program, which language you choose. Um, but so far, her interactions tend to be a little bit, um, they're still not quite there. And so what she's doing for her 
receptionist job right now is mainly just kind of doing a nice welcome for folks, which has really captivated a lot of uh, Japanese, even though they're pretty used to robots in their, in their culture. Well, yeah, I would say there may be, she's on the ridge of the uncanny valley. I, <laughs> she is still a little bit creepy to me, but I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Elise, so much. Do you have any other stories you can tell us about that you're working on? Well, we're um, actually going to be heading into some politics coming up since the um, South Korean president is headed to the U.S. soon. So uh, hopefully those of you guys who follow NPR will continue to listen along, even though, even though I have to take a little break from tech. Well, thank you, Elise. Uh, and you can follow Elise on Twitter at Elise Who. And you also have some, if people are looking for social media t tips, you just posted some slides that you did at a, a journalist's uh, meeting that, that were great. So people can check those out. And thank you so much for joining us, Elise. Thanks, Megan. Great to be with you. Take care. Bye. Coming up, a preview of Google I.O. and virtual cat reality. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. You wouldn't be listening to this right now if you didn't care about learning. Maybe you want to master Photoshop, develop an app, learn to code, or sharpen your HTML skills. lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. I know a lot of women whose kids are around my age. They've been out of the workforce for a while. It's just what Elisa and I were talking about. They want to get back in. They're looking to sharpen their skills. And one of the first things I always recommend to them is lynda.com so they can put their best foot forward in job searches. Some of the courses I recommend are strategic planning fundamentals, sol solving common project problems, and the lynda.com course on getting promoted. There's also a new course on getting up and running with LinkedIn. With a lynda.com membership, you can stream thousands of video courses on demand, complete with transcripts, which allow you to follow along or search for an answer and skip to that point in the video. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. So whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, visit lynda.com slash TN2 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. And we thank them for their support of this show. On to a few more stories we're following today. Google I.O. starts tomorrow. For those of you in the I don't know, this is the annual developers conference in San Francisco where all the latest stuff is revealed, as long as it has to do with Android OS, Android Wear, Android Auto, and Google's cloud-based services. We expect news on the mysterious Android M, Chromecast, Cardboard, and more. Jason Howell and Mike Elgin will be at the event, and Leo will be here in the studio with a whole gang of Google experts for the rest of this week. Yesterday, we saw reviews and first looks at Android Auto, Google's new service that connects your smartphone with your car and lets you access Google Maps or Spotify by voice, steering wheel controls, or touchscreen graphics on your dashboard. Android Auto also includes a safety feature that will lock your phone while your car is in use to help remind you to keep your eyes on the road. As a side note, in today's i5 for the iPhone, I recommend a great iOS app that will do the same. You can download that episode at twit.tv. Android Auto is available now in the 2015 Hyundai Sonata. Just ask dealers to download the software for free. Also, Engadget reports that all of Chevrolet's 2016 models will support, support both CarPlay, which is from Apple, and Android Auto. Recode reports that Oculus CEO said today that the soon-to-be-available virtual reality Oculus headset will, and the computer needed to run it, will cost in the $1,500 range in other Oculus news, the Facebook-owned company just bought a computer vision startup called Surreal Vision. According to ReadWrite, Surreal Vision could help Oculus extend virtual reality to real reality. Surreal Vision helps create accurate 3D models of actual scenes. I think that's teleportation that they're talking about. Surreal Vision says their technology will lead to virtual reality and augmented reality systems that can be used in any condition, day or night, indoors or outdoors. Quote, they will open the door to true telepresence where people can visit anyone, anywhere. I, for one, am ready. Speaking at the Code Conference here in California today, Snapchat CEO Evan Spiegel publicly announced that they were planning an IPO. We have no more details because his announcement automatically disappeared after 10 seconds and we were too embarrassed to take a screenshot of it. And finally, who says beat bizarre crowdfunded video games about cats never make it to the real world? Not me, not after today. Maybe you remember Cat Lateral Damage. It's a first person shooter 
But instead of being a person or a shooter, you're a cat knocking things off counters and shelves. The game raised $62,000 on Kickstarter last year and is now available to you and to me for $9 on Steam. You are welcome. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to the show using iTunes or Stitcher or Feedly or Downcast or Instacast or Deezer or a whole bunch of other ways. You can also find us on Spotify. Go to twit.tv slash TN2 to choose your favorite way to watch us. You can also write us at twit, TN2 at twit.tv. And thanks to longtime fan and self-described current twit.tv addict Susan from Ohio for her kind note about this show. She has been watching us since the screensavers, the old screensavers, not the new screensavers. You can also follow or comment on the show and on Twitter where I am at Megan Maroney or comment on our videos on YouTube. I read all of the comments, even the not so nice ones. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday. I am Megan Maroney. Thank you for watching and for participating. It would not be the same without you. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.